going to introduce our speaker, Nate Higgins. Uh, Dr. Higgins uh, gained sort of popular notoriety uh, as the editor of the pivotal online blog, The Oil Drum. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have seen his work there. But uh, previous to, to his life at The Oil Drum, he's the former president of Sanctuary, Sanctuary Asset Management. So this is his Wall Street life. Uh, former vice president of Lehman Brothers and Solomon Brothers investment firms. Um, his educational background started here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has a bachelor's degree in business. He then completed a master's uh, MBA in business finance from University of Chicago. And then just recently, 2009, completed his PhD in resource, natural resources from University of Vermont. Um, he's spoken around the country on these issues. Uh, he's, a, he's a regular at the Association for the Study of Peak Oil Conferences. He's appeared on PBS, BBC, and NPR. Um, speaking about these issues. He's also, uh, this is the second visit here with an Energy Hub event. In 2009, he gave a talk in Science Hall that's available <coughs> online and on our website. So if you're interested in seeing some of the precursors to this material, uh, please check out our website and that talk is on YouTube. So um, without further ado, I'll introduce our speaker, Nate Higgins. For those of you that have heard me talk before, which I recognize a few faces, I usually have a lot of humor in my talks, and um, I've taken most of that out tonight, so apologies for that. Um, but it's a serious topic, and it's not going to be depressing or anything, but rather than uh, go through a lot of facts, I thought I would couch these slides and this presentation through my own experience, um, because I've learned over time that truth isn't what you read in the textbooks or what you're taught necessarily, um, mostly not. It's what you experience. And what I'm going to talk about today are kind of what I would consider first principles. We have so many things going on in the world with the European situation and this violence in Connecticut and the fiscal cliff and the debt ceiling. And I'm trying to parse these down into their um, most important subcomponents, in my opinion. This is an overview of what I'm going to talk about. As I said, first principles. Um, I've been fortunate the last 12 years to not have a job and not have to need one. And now I pretty much need one because I've spent all my savings. But I used to work on Wall Street. And um, when I got my MBA, my job was to get out the Rolodexes and the, the yellow pages and any LexisNexis. I could only call on someone with $50 million or more. And I was a high net worth broker. And that's what I did is I cold called billionaires. And at my firms, I tried to um, persuade them to have their assets managed at my firm. And then I, um, in around 1999, I read uh, Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. And I read uh, uh, The End of Nature by Bill McKibben and a handful of other books. It made me realize that this is not the preordained human trajectory what we are, and I decided to give my clients their money back and uh, study this stuff full time. So the things I'm sharing with you today are things that I've learned some 60 hour weeks, some 20 hour weeks, over 12 years on, on a variety of topics. And I'm gonna go through uh, how these topics, ecology, environment, energy, finance and trade, and human behavior, relate to um, the assumptions that drive our economy. And I've been working lately, so I have some personal knowledge on this, with government officials, both in this country and, uh, and abroad decision makers. And one thing they almost all have in common <laughs> is they're flanked by someone who was trained and excelled at finance or economics. And the assumptions that back those people make it almost uh, a, an invisible shield that you can't get past to get to the leaders. And some of these assumptions I'm going to talk about today. So first topic. So this is a condensed scale of um, planetary history. The top line is geological time, four and a half billion years. And on the far right, there's a little black section that's enlarged in the middle, uh, 20 million years ago, when we were still tree dwelling, our ancestors were. And the, the far right little sliver, the, the black there, is enlarged on the bottom. That's the last 12,000 years, which is basically uh, industrial civilization when we left being hunters gatherers and um, started a more agrarian lifestyle. The black line is population, and you can see that population um, 
had a moonshot around 1750, 1800, um, and now is around 7 billion. There's two interesting parts about this graph. One is that um, the formation of modern energy supply in the Carboniferous period, uh, you know, between one and 300 million years ago, we're using all that in a fraction of, of time that it took to develop, and two, that our brain developed on, on the lower two spectrums, and, and we're having an intersection of those. The other uh, relevant point is the part labeled A is what is assumed by economists to represent all of history. And we are, um, we are it's funny really, but it's, but it's not, because we assume that everything is on this red line and that's what we base our system on. And the human uh, ecosystem is no different than any other natural system. It's polynomial in nature. It has ebbs and flows, real s sharp spikes up, down, all over the place. Yet our institutions are based on this. And that's part of my main message today is what if that line doesn't continue? Um, one of the first things I learned in my PhD is that economics textbooks teach that the environment is part of the economy. But the converse is actually true. The economy is part of the environment. The environment is our, is our, our air and our water and our nest. Um, and it, the, the real reason I left is because I realized that externalities, things that are not accounted for in our economic system that have cost to us or our ancestors or other species are not included in prices. <coughs> Depending on the boundaries of analysis, we uh, humans, seven billion of us, use between 30 and 50 percent of the net primary productivity of the planet. And there's millions of other species that compete for the rest. We're diverting those um, energy and, and resource flows towards our endeavors. Um, I'm not a climate expert. I know Bill McKibben, who's a friend of mine, was just here, and he spoke very urgently about um, <coughs> climate and the um, need to keep carbon in the ground for um, otherwise we hit tipping points. I'm not gonna talk much about that other than we have many of such environmental limits. There's biodiversity, we're impacting the biogeochemical -ge um, nitrogen phosphorus cycles on the planet. We are making an impact um, and it's becoming more obvious. I wrote my PhD on biophysical economics which has its origins in biology, optimal foraging theory which shows that in nature, organisms that are able to uh, invest the least amount of their own energy, their caloric output, to get the highest return from what they consume had evolutionary advantages for um, their procreation, uh, for stasis, for bodily functions, for extra energy when things are, are tough, all sorts of reasons. And this is called the energy return on energy investment. You can imagine a cheetah that runs all day after some mice or a rabbit would expend so much energy that even though it was successful in what it was going after, it, it would gradually starve to death. So it has to go after something large enough that there was a payoff. And this happens in the human sphere as well, uh, you might imagine, in oil and wind and uh, tar sands and other things have different energy return on investments. So the conventional economics textbooks um, I realized over time, um, treat energy the same as any other commodity. It's just something that's worth $100, which I'll talk about in a second. But energy is responsible for almost everything we have. If you um, look at uh, GDP, which is a measure of, of our transactions, um, since 1970 to 2011, uh, it's 76% correlated with how much additional energy we've thrown at the system. But since 2000, it's 95% correlated. And uh, biophysical economists look at um, what conventional economists call the factors of production, which they say are capital and labor. <coughs> but in reality, energy explains more than 50% of what we call productivity. We are rich because we use energy. Um, so our story is, is one of, of energy conversions where we take in this case, we converted um, animal feed and animal power in order to do things that we couldn't do ourselves. And that made economic sense. 
And once we found oil and coal and natural gas, we <coughs> displaced both our own labor and um, animal labor. So everything in this picture costs about $100. But everything in that picture requires energy to procure it, including energy. But a barrel of oil at $100 has 5.7 million BTUs of kinetic and chemical energy in it. If you translate that into how much energy a human could output, it works out to 1,700 kilowatt hours. An average human digging ditches or or hauling boxes or um, any sort of manual labor does about six tenths of a kilowatt hour a day. So if you work that out towards your 50 hours a week with some vacation five days a week, one barrel of oil is 11 years of those of us in a, this room working. And an average American salary of $45,000 is $500,000 of labor or wages or lower, commodity or lower good prices or higher profits that are displaced by this thing we pay $100 for. How could this happen? Well, this happened because our economic system is based on the marginal unit. And it only costs oil companies $50 to get that oil out of the ground. If they sell it for $100, everyone is happy. But the reality is, is this is not a commodity. This is the lifeblood. This is the hemoglobin of society. And we've treated it as a commodity. We've squandered it as if it would always be there. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. It will always be there, but it's going to get more expensive, and that has implications. So conventional economic theory, uh, let's take the toaster as an example and the blue line. Over time, we get more clever, and we export to cheaper places like Bangladesh or China. And for most um, appliances and goods, the cost curve goes down and down over time until it doesn't get much lower. Um, but for energy, the curve is different. Energy and resources, the iron ore in the Masaba range used to be 70% ore content, now it's 30% ore content. So we need to get a lot more of the ore in order to get the actual, um, uh, the copper that we need um, and the iron and the rest is overburdened and that takes more energy and more money. Um, in the 1930s, we would uh, invest one barrel of energy and get out 100. It was like Beverly Hillbillies bubbling right underneath the surface. By the 1970s, that ratio turned to 30 to 1. By year 2000, it was around 11 to 1. And anecdotally, right now, it's much lower than that. So energy, if you have to drill deeper in environmentally sensitive places and the oil is thicker or has more sulfur or other problems, you need to spend more energy to get that. Um, so economists assume that energy will be like this blue curve, that over time, if we have high enough prices, it will just magically procure more um, resources. The hydrocarbon molecules are there, but they're going to cost more and more, and the issue is how much can society afford when in reality we're seeing this, this red curve for natural re resources. So um, we hear a lot about um, you know, wind and solar, and I'm going to talk about a bit about those later, but if you add up all the um, 3 billion working humans on the planet and add up all the solar and wind power relative to fossil fuels, it doesn't add the much. Our lives are dependent on this right now, given our, our, um, our lifestyles anyways. So I have a friend who runs an oil company um, and is active in the back and shale. And he says for every new project that they develop, they budget a third of their cost for diesel fuel. So all these numbers we're hearing about on the Bakken, they have to be handicapped by how much energy the energy companies themselves use. Um, this is being impacted by the financial situation as well to allow these companies to get this oil. But oil, non-OPEC, has gone up in extraction costs 17% a year since 2002. Every year it costs 17% more to get it out of the ground. Eventually you can't pay, I mean even if oil is a million dollars a barrel, if it takes you one barrel of oil to get a barrel out, it doesn't help you. In talking about resources, um, we can't forget water as well. This is a, an aerial view over the Oglala Aquifer in Kansas, which is a fossil aquifer, um, meaning that it doesn't get fully replenished with rainfall. And um, you know, water for crops and water for energy are the 
primary two uses of water in the country and they're, they're interrelated. So let me talk about how uh, money fits into this picture. I would call money a claim on future energy and natural resources, and debt is a claim on future money. But let me talk about how this comes into existence. So I have an MBA and I studied finance here, and the textbooks um, are wrong. The textbooks say that, um, that banks are intermediators, that they move around assets so that everyone has what they want. The truth is that when I go to the bank and have a $100,000 loan request, they look at me and they say, yeah, this guy's probably good for it. He's got some good ideas. And they put $100,000 in my account and at the same time put a $100,000 um, asset on the bank's books. So everything's balanced. When you explain that, my dad's a doctor and I explained that to him 20 times. He's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. And, uh, but he never like got it until I told him that at that moment, $100,000 entered my account. I could go spend it on my business or whatever I wanted. $100,000 did not leave the system anywhere else. Whoever had the 100,000 still has it. I have mine. There's more money in the whole system. For a long time, this worked. In the 1920s, the 1930s, 40s, 50s, because we lived on an empty planet. We lived in an empty country. There were tons of opportunities to um, spend this. It, we were in short, shortage of money actually. There were so many opportunities um, to expand this. But in the 1970s we ran into some resource limits with OPEC, et cetera. And in order to, instead of tightening our belts and using less, we chose debt as um, the route. Um, so what is money anyways? Money doesn't mean, isn't worth anything on its own. Money is just a marker for real capital. This is my backyard, natural capital, um, trees, forest, ecosystems, um, social capital, that's my dog, but social capital might be your pets or your friends or your family or your teachers or your relatives. Um, built capital, this is my house, which is very small now, solar panels, chainsaws, uh, aloe vera. Um, and uh, built capital is, you know, tractors, houses, things that we use. And then finally, human capital. Human capital is a little more um, esoteric. It's our skills and our health. Um, this is me identifying a big hen of the woods mushroom, and that's my dad, who's a doctor, but he's growing food. So money, these digits we have in our account and these green things we have in the paper really are, are markers for what really matters to us. This is a, um, a rendition of NASCAR, and let me tell you why I put that up there. Um, debt is a claim on future money. And when we're running into problems, we go into debt. That doesn't have to be a bad thing. Because if you go into debt and build something with it that's very productive, and you pay that back in spades over time, then debt doesn't have to be a problem. I was born in 1965. Since the year I was born, the US, not just the government, but private, corporate, municipal, everything in aggregate, has borrowed more money every year than we've increased the economy. 47 years in a row. We've grown <coughs> our debt more than we've grown our economy. Now, if you have one dollar of debt that you add to the economy, and it grows the economy by one dollar, that's sustainable. If it's below one, it's not sustainable. Right now it's at zero. We're adding a dollar of debt just to keep everything constant. And once you get to zero, what you're really doing is you're transmuting wealth into income. That's what we're doing as a society. When I was a kid in the 70s, 90% of the food in Madison was made and grown 100 miles from Madison. And now we have these micro components and plastics and packaging and caps and all kinds of things from all over the world. This has been a very good thing for our living standards. But what's not looked at is what happens when this stops because there's credit or there's higher energy prices. How dependent have we become on this? The average grocery store in America has 88,000 items, supermarket. It is true that economic theory probably got those items to us at the cheapest possible way. But economic theory doesn't say whether we need all 88,000 of those or what happens when this system breaks down and gets smaller. Where are 
uh, you know, for wind turbines is one example. All the ergonomic parts from wind um, turbines come from <coughs> Korea, and we don't make them here, et cetera. How are we doing on time? 20 minutes. Yeah, so that's about right. Okay, so when I got my MBA, um, we were taught when I went and worked in finance and eventually at a hedge fund that we were cleaner fish. That we would go in and take, take out the weak and uh, move the money towards its most efficient way. In the 1980s, um, finance and insurance companies comprised 8% of the profits of the S&P. In the 1990s, it was 15%. The year 2000 to 2010, it was 45% of the profits of the S&P were from financial companies. We are no longer the, the cleaner fish. Um, we have become, uh, where speculation becomes involved, it, it is a misallocation of resources. Um, and I'll get more to this on human behavior, but we think that's okay because we worship the dollar as our cultural goal. Uh, when in reality, it's, it's misallocating things. It's only allocating correctly if dollars are the things we're supposed to be maximizing. Okay, human behavior. And I see that my um, cousin is not in the audience, which is a good thing. Um, so, um, these are bonobos. We have 98.7% of our DNA in common with bonobos and chimpanzees are an, another one of the great apes. And in economics and other social sciences, it is profoundly um, misleading that we don't base our behavior and our potential future looking on where we came from. Whatever God you believe in, we all came from the same one. And we evolved via what worked best over many, many thousands of generations. And to discard um, evolutionary trajectory of how we got here is leaving a lot of uh, opportunity on the table. For instance, in nature, animals very rarely defer consumption. So they'll come back eight days and eat some honeycomb or eat a, an elephant because they're not, they don't want to do it right now. They'll save it for later. Those organisms that saved it for later were out-consumed and out-produced and had more resources for their offspring. Um, this is called a discount rate in economics and psychology. It's how much you prefer the present versus the future. Most animals, immediately, they only care about the present. If you have dogs or goldfish, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> Humans care a little bit about the future because we have sunk costs of our institutions, and our buildings, and our mortgages, and things like that. But we're animals still and we absolutely prefer the present over the future in our behavioral decisions. This is a Cantorell oil field over the last 25 years. This is one of the four major oil fields in the world. In 1999, it started to decline and they started to do nitrogen injection to push the oil to the middle so we could get more out. In 2004, they started to do horizontal drilling to get more of the nipples there so they could get more oil out. And now it's in complete crash. This is a microcosm of our behavior that we want to get as much as we can out. Power is energy per unit time. There's something in, in biology called maximum power principle, which is we want um, energy per unit time. We don't want to use a ton of energy if we can't use it, and we don't want the most efficient. It's somewhere in the middle. But this is a behavioral trait that Look at what's happening with the debt situation right now. It's what can we do today to, to make today better, future be damned. Okay, moving on in human behavior. Um, this is about status and sexual selection. Sexual selection is a, is a term, ooh, he said sex. But in biology, that is a, an official theory. And it is about male-male competition and female choice. There's also female competition and male choice. But basically, this peacock did not need to expend all the energy, the extra energy in gathering seeds and, and, and bugs to produce this incredibly ornate tail. Because, number one, he used a lot of energy to do that. Number two, he um, is now a lot more conspicuous to a predator. And number three, if a predator sees him, he's gonna have to, uh, it's gonna be much more difficult to get away. All three of those negative fitness hits were overcome by the drab peahen's preference for males that had this ornate tail. 
Same thing with deer. Larger antlers, they compete. The winning male gets to mate um, more often. And this is called sexual selection. I've been fortunate in my career to, um, but you're not, that's not what you thought I was gonna say, <laughs> to, um, to uh, have some like, eminent biologist on my thesis committee and I'm, and I'm friends with some and this is absolutely active in the human sphere um, and I'm sure most of you realize that it is. Um, this is the largest ocean liner and the world's largest yacht but the world's largest yacht changes every year or two because some rich billionaire sees that it's 542 feet and he wants to have one that's 544 feet. We compete even without recognizing that we're competing for status. Now here's my one funny slide of the show. It reminds me of the anglerfish species where the male anglerfish spends his entire life attached to the rear of the female anglerfish. <clears throat> I just found that out, so. <laughs> so um, what does this mean in reality? We have these very large houses, um, which is one way to compete for status. Ooh, look at that nice big house that the, they have. Well, um, an economist friend of mine did a study looking at um, would people rather have a 4,000 square foot house when all their neighbors had a 6,000 square foot house? Or would they rather have a 3,000 square foot house, smaller house, when all their neighbors had a 2,000 square foot house? The vast majority of people wanted the 3,000 square foot house as long as all their neighbors had a 2,000 square foot house. This is a key driver of our behavior. There was a recent uh, financial paper the Journal of Finance that showed that relative salary matters and absolute salary doesn't matter. They, they cross-referenced and correlated with thousands of people. Not once in that article, there were 112 references, not one was in biology, that this is relative fitness. This is what happens in nature. So this is a, this is a constraint, but this is also an opportunity when we think about the future. So the United States, as one example, um, I used the um, uh, uh, subjective well-being study by Engelhardt and looked at happiness across every country in the world. And the United States uses um, three times the energy as Ireland, and Irish people are just about the same happiness as us. We use 38 times the energy as the Philippines. Philippines is a poor country, but people there, they don't have the same standard of living as us, but they're just as happy. So a lot of this stuff we go through is just to give us our feelings for the day, but it doesn't really make us any happier. So we go back to this, this is what wealth is, but we don't really pursue wealth. We pursue the feelings of getting wealth. We go in the refrigerator at midnight and want something. It's not because we're starving, we're fat, but the feeling of a haagen feels good to us. It's the neurotransmitters that we want. Warren Buffett has admitted that he doesn't need all this money, he does it for the game. I had clients that were billionaires, or I had clients that were worth $100 million, and all they wanted to do was make to $200 million. And then they were going to buy an island and quit. Well, five years later, they had $400 million. They were still at it. Every morning they got up, they didn't care. They, they looked at their account balance to get their dopamine squirt. Um, shopping center, public speaking. We get our chemicals somehow. The problem is, is that our society is getting those chemicals in environmentally deleterious ways right now. That's not even the worst problem. The worst problem is we're setting an aspiration for the rest of the world. And China's got a billion two that are coming on trying to be just like us. So <laughs> conventional microeconomics, not as egregious of errors as macroeconomics, but there are still problems. Um, we talk about what's called Pareto optimality, which is economics works as long as a decision is made where one person is not made worse off if you're made better off. But this breaks down in our society because um, utility is another piece of pie for a 500 pound guy when someone is starving in Africa. It just doesn't work out. I, I recently did some research on um, price, elastic, price elasticity of food and on raw food, in America, the price elasticity is six one hundredths of one percent. So if something goes up by one dollar, we will consume six cents less of it. In Zambia, the price elasticity of raw food is seven tenths of one percent. 
So if something goes up by a dollar, of course it's not linear the whole way up, but everything else being equal, they can't afford it. They will consume 70% less because they can't afford it. So this translates as we get our utility from getting maybe 10 or 20 cent cheaper gasoline because of corn ethanol and people somewhere else are starving. So economics breaks down. When Jeremy Bentham and Adam Smith, you know, the originators of these theories, utility works. Everyone pursuing things in their best interest works when all incomes are about the same. When income is very different, it optimizes, it, 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 it allocates what's best for money. It doesn't allocate what's best for society. I don't know how this is gonna change, but I, I just wanted to point it out. The other thing is that self-deception is a huge core driver of our species. Um, a million out of a million college entrance uh, high school students said they were better than average at getting along with other people. 90% of professors think they're better than average. And there's countless examples where we think we're better than we are, but this carries over into decision making, into politics. <laughs> They've shown uh, behavioral uh, physiology where if you're by yourself and you're doing a spatial um, exercise, you get it right about 90% of the time. They put you in a group of seven or eight people, and it turns out, and then they measure your brain waves while you're doing this, it turns out that the most um, charismatic, persuasive person not only changes your mind, but you're not saying, oh, I, I need to defer to this alpha male because I know I'm right, but I'm just gonna go. No, he actually changes your mind in thinking that he's right and that your original answer was wrong. It's really profound research. And this happens in our political system all the time. You're gonna leave here and this is gonna, a lot of it makes sense to you, but then you're gonna run into someone that's saying something totally different and then that's gonna overwrite what I said tonight. So that's why I'm trying to tell you how I see these things, how I've experienced them, uh, because this stuff is not something that you can like read in a book, I mean, you can find the references, but you have to intuit it. The other part of economic theory that um, is lacking is that we're rational, self-interested man. We do things in our self-interest and everything's gonna fall together and work out. They don't even care about what we care about other people and it's absolutely clear that we're an empathic species. We smile and we see kids smile at back of us. We have mirror neurons. We're a born empathic species. And this is not factored into our economic system at all. It's self-interest will produce everything cheaply so that we'll all be better off. <coughs> it doesn't work that way. Now I'm gonna put it together. Now this is a, um, the other stuff I just said, I've studied for many years, so I'm very fluent in it. I may be wrong, but at least I, I know the, the angles of it. This is what is likely gonna happen, or the landscape of the future. And I view the future as a probability distribution. I, anyone that says they know what's gonna happen, that's unlikely. I know what's probably not likely to happen and what could happen, and I'm gonna talk about that. Oh, by the way, that was my other funny graph. Because it's true, for most people, I mean, you are all self-selected audience. You wanted to learn about these topics. You came here, a lot of you already know some of these things. But for the average person, to tell these things is, is A, very confusing, and B, like, whatever. I, I mean, how does that help me? How does that impact me? So if there is a communication strategy in the future that will help make things more benign trajectory, um, I don't know that all these facts are relevant. Um, but I'm gonna get to that in a second. So the green period is the 1920s to the 1970s where we had um, plenty of open space, 40 years of, of increasing oil production to go. The yellow period is uh, the 1970s to the early 2000s where we had um, energy limits but we suppressed them by going to credit as a model. Uh, the red is the 2000s where the credit model didn't work anymore, but the government took over the central bank, uh, the, the commercial bank model. So the government now is increasing credit. How long could this go? Could go for a while longer. Could go for three, four more years. I do not think it possibly could go longer than that. And it could be a lot shorter than that. Which of the four colors is more likely? I don't know. Um, they're all possible. Um, <coughs> it's possible we could find some new energy source, some $5 a barrel oil equivalent and everything you know, continues apace. In that environment, I would um, 
assert that we're not mature enough as a species to have $5 in oil again because we would pull in all kinds of um, non-energy limiters from the environment and something else would quickly become limiting. But it's possible. Okay, so this I made this morning and it's a little convoluted, but I'm, I'm working out this idea. So this is what we're focused on, right? GDP. This is what the election and, and everyone's focused on. So we need constant energy to get GDP. I do not believe we have cheap enough energy, especially oil, um, to continue GDP because the more energy goes up, the more energy that the energy companies themselves need. So in order to get GDP going, we either need cheaper energy or we borrow from future energy. Well, how do you do that? Well, you get more debt, which is a claim on future energy. And if we use it today, that means in the future, there'll be le less of it and it'll be more expensive. Or we borrow from other countries. We move resources here so we consume them and they're part of the economic juggernaut and they give up their valuable resources for paper. So maintaining GDP is an act between energy and resources, debt, and moving resources from the country, from other countries. Of course, productivity and technology play a role in this, um, but not as big a role of energy. And that's you know, a, a topic for a whole, whole other lecture. I mean, basically what you need to know about energy is energy is in a race. Um, we're in a race between technology and depletion. And if you know that we've gone from 100 to 1 to 30 to 1 to 10 to 1 to something less, depletion is trumping technology. <clears throat> so where are we going? Um, we could continue to grow. I have to walk over here now. Um, it depends what the governments do, right? They're probably going to come through with a deal at the 11th hour. They will come through deals with the 11th hour for a very long time. And that means that on the one side we have deflation because if they said, you know what, we're gonna tighten our belts, we're gonna pay the piper now. Right now, if you told me what the government was gonna borrow next year, I could tell you with 90% confidence what GDP would be. We're that linked. It's all based on government spending now. Everything else is gonna work as hard as it can to get there, but government spending is the story. So if government can continue to spend, we're gonna to continue to kind of muddle along. Now governments could come in and just print money like mad or um, QE they call quantitative easing and then we might have inflation. I think we're walking a precarious cliff there. Some of the European countries are now facing austerity. By the way, this debt productivity issue I mentioned, it's not just the United States, it's not just Europe, it's all developed and developing countries. The BRIC nations are following our identical model. China is building what they're doing on private credit, uh, which is guaranteed by the government. So they also are pulling resources forward in time. So it's my hypothesis that the economy is going to get smaller, not because we wish it. Environmentalists 20, 30 years ago were saying we should desire a smaller economy because it'd be better for us, be better for the environment. This is gonna happen because of physical reasons. I don't know that it's gonna happen this year, but it's gonna happen in the next five years. Um, and it does not have to be a bad thing. I think the biggest danger of it is that we don't expect it and that our government and our, our cultural um, mores are such that the American dream and <coughs> they released this week, for the, I don't know if many of you saw it, for the first time in history, um, the Pew Research or whatever showed that we expect our kids to have a worse life than us. First time in history. Okay, well that's probably true. Worse defined by how much stuff we consume, that's probably true. Doesn't mean that I have to have a worse life. Um, so this is something I'm working on right now. Um, the top graph is uh, France, or no, I'm sorry, Germany, France, Switzerland, Belgium, Netherlands. Um, this is oil use over the last 10 years. You can see kind of a cyclical thing. Um, but basically it's flat with all the renewable energy and everything. Their oil consumption in those countries, the core Europe, is flat. The bottom graph is Greece, um, Portugal, and Ireland. Same continent, same currency, but they can't afford the energy. So two things. Over the last decade, they're using a little bit less, 
And also the seasonality is disappearing. What does that mean? Well, the last two years in Greece, wood stoves were up, sales were up 100% each year. So they can't afford the oil, they're burning trees. And I'm trying to do an analysis on exactly how much of the forests. Our brains are, in an evolutionary sense, are no different than the Easter Islanders. So this is a <laughs> challenge. It's funny, but it's true. When faced, I mean, the good news is, is that we're still incredibly rich. I don't know if I have a slide upcoming or not, but it's important to point out that our endosomatic consumption of energy, how much we use in our bodies, is about 2,500 or 3,000 calories, or for me, a little bit more. And for the uh, um, ex exosomatic, if you include our share of these lights and the projector and the oil that got us here and everything else, it's 235,000 calories. So it's a huge amount of buffer that we have. It's not like we're redlining it. And we still are using twice what we used when I was a kid. And I had a great childhood, as did many of you. Um, so it's important, you know, we see all these crises facing us and it's important to, to understand them and kind of face them, but um, also look at perspective of, of what it all means. So here's some semi-conclusions. Our society, I mean, I think our species has a tendency to blame people. It's the 1%. It's those people. It's the Iranians. It's the environmentalists. It's the Republicans or whatever. Capitalism kind of had to happen. We were a very clever species that came upon this bonanza and we could have done it a couple different ways, but using energy and using power is kind of who we are. We may not eventually, we may eventually learn from that and overcome it, but capitalism is like water running downhill. It, that was the natural course of it. And it's, it's really no one's fault, um, but we're all in it together. We talk about isms. I, I think we're in the last gasp of capitalism. Um, socialism in this country is akin to saying devil worship or something like that. But this is a socialist country right now, don't kid yourself. And we've been for some time with all the guarantees and everything. I mean, it's like pseudo turbo capitalism, I don't know. But the only thing that I'm sure, the only ism I'm sure is going to be prevalent and important in the future is altruism. But as far as the political, I, I don't know what's going to happen. So when we talk about all these issues, um, it's important to consider what, what lens we're viewing. Because if we're wearing a climate hat, if we're wearing a climate lens, and that's what we care about, if that's all we care about, we should leave all the carbon in the ground for the next thousand years. That's just not going to happen. If we care about the economy, we should burn all the resources we can. That shouldn't happen. But it, there's many different hats. This is a multivariate problem, and we have to have the correct lens, the correct compass, and then we have to do it in, in the correct amount of time. A lot of the problems in, in politics and in energy space is people say, this, we need to do this. And they, they assume that everything else is going to freeze and not move. Ceteris paribus, paribus, everything else being equal. This EIA analysis saying that the U.S. is going to be an energy exporter by 2020, or that we're going to surpass um, Saudi Arabia. That says nothing about how much the energy is going to cost or how much we can afford. Um, and they just assume the environment aside. And so we need in senior policy positions, and you that are at the universities, we need more systemic thinking. People that integrate lots of these different views in order to come to coherent um, decision. So um, briefly, I'm going to spend a few minutes on, on what this might mean for the Midwest, for Wisconsin. Three minutes? Something like that. Five minutes. Four. I'll do it in four. four. Okay. Um, so basically, what if we're following the wrong line? All of our institutions are looking at the blue line. All of them. CBO, that's the CBO Congressional Budget Office, says that we're going to grow at 2% a year. I met with people at the Federal Reserve last year, and they have 2% a year with a quarter percent either side. And I asked them, well, what happens if we would be at zero or negative? He's like, that would be very bad. <laughs> but they don't, they don't have a forecast for that because, of course, energy prices get high enough, we're going to produce more energy, 
And um, what if the red line is more likely in what we're going to face? My main objective for being here tonight is so that some, of, some people carve off their efforts to working on the red line instead of the blue line. And maybe 5% of you switch what you're doing to do something that's more aligned with a likely future. I, I don't know all the answers because we can't. We can just know that some of the things that we've based our decisions on until now are, are not exactly copacetic. So I think that we will go from massive globalization because of uh, inability of credit growth and higher energy costs. We're going to go towards more localization and regionalization. What we need is massive nearshoring. We need um, regional blocks of um, medical supplies, food, water, sanitation, you know, basic goods. We can still import our luxury stuff from Sweden or China or whatever, but there needs to be a, um, and that's gonna, you know what? We always could have done that. The reason we didn't, because it costs more. It costs more, so we, we, we need to trade efficiency and profit for resiliency. And that's gonna mean a little sacrifice, but it can be done. It's not that long ago that our ancestors knew that their future and their well-being was correlated with how much land they had, how much sun they got, how much rain they got, how good their soils were. And we are completely clueless. There was an article in the LA Times a couple weeks ago. Some guy actually thought energy came from the wall. And I'm sure kids in cities think that their food comes from Piggly Wiggly. We need a better understanding of biophysical economics, where our wealth really comes from. One of the things I'm working on is trying to do a mandatory high school curriculum on biophysical issues before they're exposed to economics. How many people saw the movie Contact? A few people. So we're not going to convince the government to do this stuff. Oh, yeah, you're right. Economics is kind of wrong, so we're going to change. That is not going to happen. So in Contact, it was a science fiction movie where they wanted to go to outer space, and someone sabotaged their big space machine, but no one knew that they were building another one in parallel at the same time. And I think something from that might be pulled into our experience where we continue this path because there's so much momentum on it, but maybe some people work on a parallel path at the same time on more, more localized and regional. Um, I think our decisions, um, everyone in this room's decisions can matter. Uh, I want to point out that energy, um, renewable energy is the answer ultimately. It's just not the answer to economic growth. I'm not anti-renewables. I'm anti the thought that renewables can continue this. Um, so even if renewables are twice as expensive as fossil fuels, or that depleting fossil fuels are twice as expensive as old fossil fuels, that means they still provide a hell of a lot of benefit to us. So don't forget that. Um, since I only had four minutes, I will point out that the logical path for a lot of this is to go out and buy guns and, and uh, gold. And from an individual standpoint, under some trajectories, that may make sense. But from a pro-social standpoint, those things are not viable choices. Because buying gold is an acceleration of continuing this acquisitor meme in society where I have mine and you've got to work for yours. And it just doesn't, it won't end in the paradigm shift that we need. This is Will Allen's growing power in Milwaukee. I don't know how many of you know of this, but last week it was announced that all the public schools in Milwaukee are going to use the greens and vegetables that Will grows locally for their school lunches. Little examples like that, we got to scale that in this, in this state. Um, so very briefly, because I've, I've extended my time, what have I done? I used to make a lot of money. I've spent almost all of it. I'm almost broke. I've never been happier in my life. I do have some land where I live. Uh, with a small family. We have uh, five cats and three dogs and some horses and chickens. And one of the things I do is um, Saturday is not to save money and not to save the planet, but to save our brains. We have no electricity day, which has kind of morphed since we have a 14 year old daughter into, um, into no internet day, which is hard enough. But it's just a way to, it's just a way to disconnect and to instead of the constant <laughs> stimulation of unexpected word of checking, I'm back on a human scale for 24 hours. Um, and I have cheated on that, but I think it's, um, it's valid. And this is my Saturday morning with my half hour of battery power on my computer before it dies. <laughs> okay, I, I'd forgotten I left this in, but I'll, I will say it anyway. So this is my stepdaughter. Um, I will never have a biological daughter because of the choices I made. But last week I went to her parent-teacher conference. 
I knew she was terrible in, in science and math, not doing well, but she has A's or A pluses and everything else. Her geography teacher told me, this is one of the best students I've ever had. I'm like, what, really? I know she was getting an A. She, and then she started tearing up. She said, she is the best student I've ever had. And I'll tell you why. She understands the material. She's interested, she cares. She makes the people around her better. I don't know how she does it in 14 year old language, but if someone's sloughing or not paying attention, she uses language to make them better and she motivates people. And I was like unbelievably proud because I felt maybe some of my wacko talk that she overhears is making an impact on her. And ultimately, that's all we can do, right? There's gonna be a lot of great people that do great things. Maybe Bill McKibben will accomplish something, but most of us, we can just try and be better people. And I think that's gonna make a difference. And let's start the conversation about this state. That's all I had.